The Intellectual Dark Web is a name given to a group of alternative media personalities, from Joe Rogan to Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Could it also be a spontaneous emergence of a new and more highly evolved level of consciousness into the media landscape? That's what the integral philosopher Ken Wilber believes, and it's something he's been predicting since the 90s. Ken Wilber had serious health problems for the last decade, but is now returning to the conversation. He believes that the intellectual dark web is the start of a genuinely next level or integral conversation. One that lets go of the ideology and fixed thinking of the past and can embrace paradox and nuance. These stages apply to an enormous number of different skills and so you can have dozens of different names for these stages and it can get confusing. So one of the things we do is just give them, give them colors. So the previous ethnocentric stage we call amber, and then this orange, rational, world-centric, universal care stage we call orange. Those two stages, amber, ethnocentric, conventional, traditional, and then this new orange, universal, universal rights, these started to arise again during the Western Enlightenment. With the 60s, that new stage of uh, world-centric development tended to emerge, and that's what we call green, or it was multicultural. So it wasn't just an, an, uh, a belief in individuality and its freedom. There's a lot of different opinions about postmodernism on the intellectual uh, dark web. In general, Nobody likes it. Um, my point, some things we can talk about, is that a lot of it really is off the wall, extreme, bad, however you, you want to think about it. But that it also had a core of some true, if very partial, notions. Um, and those truths were initially what actually helped to drive that stage of development. And it did start to call itself postmodern because it was reflecting on the previous modern stage of orange, liberal, rational, universal care, individual, liberty, freedom, freedom of speech. It reflected on all of those intended to have sort of a, a critique of those. But it's still having trouble finding ways to actually integrate them. And so it tends to take a stance that believes in radical egalitarianism. And so its version of equality is unlike the previous orange version of equality. Orange's version is liberty and freedom of opportunity. For green and its egalitarianism, it wants equal outcome. And this becomes enormously conflictual yeah, they're, they're too, they don't get along well at all, for starters. And given the fact that the original orange equality actually meant freedom of opportunity, orange's version of equality was often, often just called freedom. It was in favor of the freedom of individuals. Whereas green's version of equality, it, equal outcome, and so it tended to just be called equality or equity. And so you had freedom and equality. And Alex de Tocqueville was one of the first to point out that because human beings are born with different capacities, and you can have either freedom or equality, but you can't have both. And, and that's exactly right. You, you could almost frame this as the division between classical liberalism and postmodernism that a lot of people, like the intellectual dark web, are really fighting hard on behalf of classical liberalism. That's exactly right. And one of the things that happen as you go back and look at this original right and left distinction, and again, there, there are several ways that those can be defined, but one of the ways that they can be defined does have to do with these stages of development. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the other ways. Uh, Jonathan Haidt has a particular description of it. Uh, Jordan Peterson gives at least two 
definitions of left and right, one based on big factor analysis, progressives tend to be more open and conservatives tend to be more conscientious, particularly suborder, uh, a sub subtype order. Um, and they also see hierarchies of competence as necessary. And so the right tends to support those. But any sort of hierarchies tend to generate inequality. And so the left hates that and, and tries to tear those down. So you, you need both of those uh, interacting. I agree with all of that. But it's also a factor that you see left and right as you track these stages of development. And particularly going from the original amber ethnocentric into orange freedom world-centric into green equality world-centric. And so we started out, we had the original traditional right, it tends to be ethnocentric, and again, it can be a bit racist and a bit sexist, and it's not embarrassed about those. It's fine with that. It thinks that's the way uh, it should be. And then you have orange, um, which was the original liberal philosophy of individual rights and um, rights for all, universal individual rights. Um, and that really was profound. That got rid of slavery. That you know, just enormous number of changes that happened with that. And then we moved up to the green multicultural, which was really post-liberal. In many cases, became anti liberal. It doesn't really like free speech. It doesn't really like individual rights. It wants group rights, group identity. It's very willing to curtail free speech, or even on the other hand, compel free speech in order to serve social justice ends. And that infuriates an enormous number of people on, on, on the dark web, and I think rightly, rightly so. So what started to happen is that as the original left, which started this orange individual equal opportunity, as I don't know exactly how many of them, but I'm going to say half, about half of them as progressive bumped up to the new green starting in the 60s. The other half stayed with the original liberal left values. But now you had an old left and a new left. The right, essentially, given this new stage that had been added, it bumped up a stage too, or half of it did. So the old original right stayed at ethnocentric, including in its extremes white supremacists, Nazis, fascists. But then the other half bounced up to orange. And they actually started inhabiting the values of the traditional liberal. And, but these were now being embraced by people on the right. And so what you see in, in the intellectual dark web as the Democrats continue to move into this multicultural, egalitarian, green equity movement is that those progressives were leaving behind the original liberal values, including things like free speech. Whereas the people that had become vocal supporting those liberal values were now people from the right. They were new rights. They were Republicans that were doing that. And Weinstein, for example, Brett, I think, says, I don't even, I'm flabbergasted at the fact that the right is now holding the values that, as a leftist, I grew up believing. And almost all of the people on the intellectual dark web, including Dave Rubin, uh, Jordan Peterson, will say, I'm a classic liberal. And it's not that they're at orange. Most of them, I'll argue, are actually second tier. The second tier is the stage that can integrate literally all of the first stages. But what's getting left out is you have this green multicultural egalitarianism that's being taken to such extremes, it's really becoming absolutistic in its view. So you have absolutistic to multiplistic to relativistic. 
And the problem with relativistic is it becomes very open to what's called performative contradictions. It becomes very open to self-contradictory statements. It does it almost all the time. So it'll maintain, for example, that it is universally, undeniably true that there is no universal truth. Um, it'll maintain that all knowledge is social construction. It's all an interpretation. It all depends upon which culture it's arising in. And yet everything that I just said that represents the green point of view, it maintains that its view is not culturally constructed. It's true for all people at all places at all time. It's not a matter of interpretation. It's got real truth. Nobody else has truth because objective truth doesn't exist. But that view itself is held to be objectively true by the postmodernists. So they do get caught up in this enormous kind of contradiction. And they do tend to absolutize their view. There are two ways you can end up at absolutistic beliefs. One is that you're just on your way up through the growth stages yourself, and you're at that stage. And people, by the way, can stay at that stage for the entire adult life. The fact that we have higher stage doesn't mean that you have to develop there. It's one of the problems. Um, but so they'll have that absolutistic view just because they're on the way of passing through it. But if at any higher stage you latch onto a view with such absolute, uncritical absolutism, you can start to regress to the actual absolutistic stage. Because that's where you feel right. That's where you feel, yeah, this is, I know I've got it right. This is it. So you end up regressing to, to an absolutistic, ethnocentric stage. And the problem with that is that it is ethnocentric. It is tribal. And identity politics lends itself to tribalism. Because what you're emphasizing is your particular tribe. And you'll know if you're doing that from a world-centric stance, if when you talk about your tribe, in addition to whatever important differences there are, you also talk about what your tribe has in common with all the other tribes. Then that's world-centric. There's a unity in diversity with that. But if you just talk about your tribe and how it's different from all the other tribes and is there some sort of special attention, that's ethnocentric, absolutistic tribalism. And so what we have is original far right ethnocentric tribalists being joined by the really highly developed progressive green identity politics that have regressed to that absolutistic Retribalized stage. Which, which of those two do you think is more dangerous right now? Well, that depends in a sense on um, what community you look at. The intellectual dark web is mostly alarmed by the fact that the far right, and, and by the way, the, even the not many of them have an actual developmental framework to interpret it with. They still intuitively understand this stuff. And so I think it was uh, Majid Nawaz that first began referring to the far left as the regressive left. And that's what they were intuiting, is that this left is actually regressing back down to this ethnocentric, absolutistic stage. And the concern for them, from Jonathan Haidt to Jordan Peterson to Dave Rubin, is that college campuses are now overrun, and academia itself is overrun by believers in this absolutistic, um, green, multicultural, egalitarian identity politics. And they're doing it so much, they really are tending to regress to absolutistic stages. And so at absolutistic stages, you don't even have to talk to the other person. Because your tribe is right, you know your tribe is right, anybody that disagrees with you is Hitler. 
And what's so bizarre is that we used to look at the far right for that kind of absolutistic insanity. Now we're getting it from the far left. That's exactly what it's like. What the hell happened? How did that occur? And that regression back down to a retribalized, polarized stance, that's part of the horrifying problem that we're now facing in, in, in uh, culture wars. And that's one of the main things that's driving it. So the only value that was getting left out as you had these regressive, well, as you had the normal far right and the regressive far left, is so green was down to amber and amber was at amber, and it was just orange sort of hanging out there by itself. It had old Democrats who would really no longer speak up for that because the new democratic orientation is multicultural, egalitarian, identity politics. And so the old traditional liberals and the Democrats don't have much of a say. It is, again, Republicans that are now voicing support for individual rights, free speech, and so on. The concern is that far right uh, hate groups are a very real concern in the culture. And um, very few um, IDW people would, would deny that. But their concern is the way it's moving into, in, into academia and simply sort of taking over that, um, that entire area. Um, most many of the people that belong to the intellectual dark web um, at one time started out as leftists. And they were leftists when left meant orange liberal. And then as left started to move into this illiberal egalitarianism and identity politics, the original Democrats, the original leftists looked at it and said, I don't recognize that party anymore. Something's wrong with that. And so most conspicuously somebody like Dave Rubin will actually, you know, have a whole public conversion and say, you know, why I'm no longer uh, a member of the left. And what they mean is this green, extremist, far left, regressive stance, um, the regressive left. And that's really, really a problem. One of the things that needs to happen, in my opinion, if you look at all of these developmental models, and you see these stages up to green, they're all first tier, and you realize that first tier, by definition, can't integrate each other. They actually sort of disagree with each other to a greater or lesser extent, but there's a disagreement all the way down. As soon as you start getting to some of the stages at second tier, they tend to look at all of the previous stages as being important. And they realize if nothing else, everybody's born at square one and has to go through all those stages. So we can't just look at somebody who's at ethnocentric amber, or we can't just look at somebody who's at orange or look at somebody at green and give them, you know, a nice uh, hour or two reasoned argument about why they're wrong and they shouldn't be, you know, thinking that way. That's not how you move through stages of development. Stages of development, you can't reason somebody out of the stage of development they're in. Um, somebody once said you can only reason somebody out of a stance that they were reasoned into. Well, you're not reasoned into stages of development. They start, you know, when you're one month old and you go through in Piaget, you know, six stages of sensory motor development and then a couple stages of pre-operational development, a couple stages of concrete operational and then into formal operational orange reason and so on. And you have to go through just a whole series of trial and error and working out at a stage, trying to make it work. When it starts to fail, 
and you start to open yourself to new approaches. And because we all have these higher stages as potential in us, then when that happens, the next higher stage can start to come down. What we're looking at right now, and, and one of the reasons I think that the intellectual dark web has particularly arisen at this time is that we really did have the emergence of this new stage of development. And it really is radically uh, relativistic, radically egalitarian, puts a great deal of emphasis on equal outcome, and sees any differences at all as the product of oppression or discrimination. And that's what so many of the intellectual dark web people are fighting against. They're not saying, okay, well, they're saying, look, it's, it's possible that some of that is oppression, no doubt. But there are also other reasons that we see these differences. And they might have to do with different interests in male and female, for example. Um, Nobody is holding that as an absolutistic view. Um, but it's, it's a view that they're not going to rule out. And you, you start to see this um, in an enormous number of important um, areas in, in terms of just how men on average and women on average have different types of interests in, in just what they find interesting. There's no evidence they have different capacities. It's not that men are cognitively smarter than women or anything like that. It's just they have different things that they consider important in life and they tend to pursue those. And part of the problem that hasn't been answered well with the green far left feminists is, okay, well just how do we handle that? If we have that in today's college, the majority of degrees are going to women in almost every major area. There are more women in medicine, more women in law, more women in psychology, in sociology, in psychotherapy, and so on. The only places that the men still dominate is here, just the STEM fields. Um, and so our, the fact that there are 80% of women in psychology, then does that mean men are being oppressed? I mean, shouldn't we be doing something about that if we're trying to worry about getting it to 50-50? And those are the issues that aren't addressed very well. The suggestion from developmental studies is that those kinds of issues start to, first of all, be conceived more adequately from second tier. And second tier, again, is this leap to stages of development that can actually integrate all the previous stages. They do have a capacity to prioritize. They do bring things together into uh, coherent systems that have an enormous amount of diversity, but they also have a common unity with them. In your conversation with Tom and Mark, you mentioned something very interesting about integral looks for what is missing. Because I often get criticized right. or people say you focus a lot of your content on the shortcomings of the left right. which is true and they say you don't focus so much on the right but your perspective is if the big problem for us moving forward is are the blind spots of progressivism right. then integral will automatically look at those more is well, that true exactly what you have with um certainly as far as i can tell um the vast majority of the intellectuals on the dark web. Um, there have been several um, accounts of what they have in common. I wouldn't necessarily d uh, disagree with those. I think there's a lot of truth to that. But the one that I would add is almost all of them are thinking from second tier stages. They really want to know how all these things fit together. And what they really don't want to do is just a priori exclude something because they just know that's wrong. They don't do that. And that's why there's this intentional drive, for example, to have open conversations 
among people that do have disagreements. And this is actually set up as part of the ongoing dark web. That's what happens. As, as you know, there's a whole uh, series of shows on the road where Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson will argue these points and moderated by Brett Weinstein or Douglas Murray or somebody like that. And thousands of people are showing up for these things and they last two and three hours. People are enormously interested in these topics and that's what's so important um, about the fact that they are coming together on a place that this could almost happen nowhere else but the net. That does seem to be one of the ways the net is now kind of overcoming how it got derailed a bit when it started you know, a decade or two ago, everybody, particularly the boomers, would say, oh, this is going to be a global brain. It's going to unite all humanity. It's going to be the single greatest unifying force in the history of the world. And then about 15 decades later, it's the single most polarizing thing that happened. Because it just turns out that how you can search data means you can search for those things that just, uh, you agree with, and then you end up talking there, and then you end up in these so-called echo chambers. And the polarization gets greater and greater and greater, and then it's added to by the so-called Mardi Gras effect. In Mardi Gras, when you're wearing a mask and people can't see you, you tend to do a lot nastier things than if they could actually see who you are because you have a, you have a mask. Well, that's what social media is like. You can mask yourself and be anything, anything you want. So it encourages you to come up. It's a race to the bottom. In other words, it's a race to the, to the not, not our better angels, but our worst devils. And those, those tend to come out. So now what we're seeing with dark web is a little bit of an overcoming of that. And we're starting to find ways of, of building these holes. Do you think this polarization is an existential threat? Yeah, and certainly... So what do we do about it? Certainly in terms of the, um, the degree of extremism of polar, polarization. And I think Jonathan Haidt did a study um, looking at polarization among typically uh, polarized groups. So he, he came up with these series of measurements um, that measured the degree of polarization between groups like male and female, wealthy and disadvantaged, black and white, um, you know, educated, uneducated, all that kind of thing. And he had some sort of arbitrary scale that was something like around 0 to 20, where 20 was most polarized and 0 was least polarized. And so he found things like male and female and rich and poor, uh, educated and uneducated and so on. That degree of polarization went up to about 10 points of separation. And then there was this huge leap all the way up to left and right, and that was 18 points. I mean, it was just, that was off the wall polarized. And what was even more disturbing is that if you looked at left and right, say, 50 years ago, and you had polls saying, what do you, whether you're left or right, think about your opponents, left or right? And, and the typical answer would be things like, I really do disagree with them. Um, I, I think their heart's in the right place, but I, I, I just can't agree with, with what they're saying. The typical response now, the majority of responses are, the other group, they're evil. They're just demonic. Uh, there's nothing they say is right, and the sooner we get rid of them, the better. That's not good. And that's increasingly what's starting to happen, particularly, and one of the real problems is that as you look at these ongoing stages of development throughout human history, you do have kind of a leading edge, and it does tend to set the sort of tenor of the epic of that time. So you have really brilliant developmentalists like Gene Gepser, who's traced these stages in terms of their worldview, 
And so he finds, we said there's sort of on average six to eight stages up to today, further stages coming. But Gebser comes up with stages that he named, I'll tweak these a little bit, but an archaic stage, a magic stage, a mythic stage, a rational stage, a pluralistic, relativistic stage, and an integral second tier stage. And those were unfolding um, over history um, as well. And part of what we're seeing right now is the emergence of that integral or second tier stage really for the first time in history. Now, it wasn't that there weren't very advanced individuals who had that kind of cognition. Um, certainly, you know, Aristotle, Plotinus, that kind of individual. Um, but in terms of having like around 10% of the population reach those stages, whenever we see about 10% reach that leading edge, we do tend to see a sort of tipping point in culture. And that's what happened with the Western Enlightenment, for example. Really only about 10% of the population was actually at that orange formal operational cognitive stage. But those values just started to kind of seep out a bit. And it wasn't that people would just fully accept them. If they did, they'd actually be at the orange stage themselves. But they were more open to them. And, and they became um, not as reactionary to them. So even something like the American Civil War, where you're having people fight to end ethnocentric slavery, there's still less than 10% of the population is actually at those stages. But it impacted enough people that close to a million young men and women died trying to end slavery. I mean, that's, those kinds of things are just profound. The same thing happened in the 60s when we started to get a green emergence. As soon as it went over around 10%, we actually got the so-called revolution of the 60s. And that was when we started introducing all of these radically egalitarian uh, civil rights movements and so on. Uh, and then even concerned with the environment as a living organism. We had to give attention to the environment. And all of those were part of the healthy aspects of green. It's what they introduced. But the problem is that as green continued to become more and more extreme, more and more radical, more and more egalitarian, more and more equal outcome, period, that was the leading edge of our overall evolution, starting right around the 60s. And that's where all of a sudden we start to see this shift that people are still trying to figure out right now. They're still going, what the hell happened to liberal values? This isn't the Democratic Party I grew up with. And, and, and then also you know, people like Weinstein saying, and this isn't the Republican Party I grew up with either. And there was this wild shift in terms between these fundamental value structures in addition to all these other things that were happening. But this was happening. And because green, as a leading edge, was becoming increasingly broken, increasingly extremist and absolutistic and even regressive, that's a disaster for a leading edge. Because as it started to fall apart, and its self-contradictions caught up with it more and more and more, all it really degenerated into for foundational places to rest was nihilism. First of all, because there is no objective truth, so truth is out the window. And then in terms of, well, what values are right, no values are right. They're all equally right. So narcissism. So, so the leading edge tended to be governed by that tag team from postmodern hell, nihilism and narcissism. And those are horrifying, that you can't have a leading edge of culture driven by nihilism and narcissism, because it has no conception of which way to go. When all you've got is nihilism, you can't, well, I've got no idea what's the right way to go, so I'll just do my own deal. And then everybody's, you know, retribalized, and and it's a disaster.
I know many people who would say that your thought is one of the most influential things in their development, in their growing up. Do you have a sense why, and there was a real high watermark for Integral, probably in the mid 2000s, do you have a, has it had the impact on the world that you hoped it would have? And, and, and if, if not, why not? Yes, I've been very actually um, happily um, 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 impressed by, by how, it's, how it's doing. Um, one of the um, major, my, um, my students um, have, have divided my overall um, work uh, into five major uh, stages. And you can see a continuity through all of them. And in, in an odd way, they really do transcend and include. Um, I mean, each, of the, each time I've sort of proposed some, some new additions to integral theory, they, in almost all cases, they've included all the previous stuff. I don't disagree with that. I've just added some more stuff that I found that's important. And so it, it sort of keeps going like that. Um, when I hit around so-called stage four, that is fun. it was a book called Sex, Ecology, Spirituality. Um, and it really did cause a bit of a sensation, um, at least in these small circles that think about these kinds of things. Um, and for about the next 10 years, there was um, an enormous amount of theoretical talk about it. Um, and so that was, um, uh, happened all around the world. There were um, over, like I said, the book's been translated into uh, upwards of 30 foreign languages. Um, there are integral institutes um, starting or started in um, several dozen uh, countries and so on. And so there was this, this really strong uh, theoretical discussion about these issues um, tended to be critical. Um, any of the good ideas that came up, I immediately incorporated. Um, but th the net result of all of that tended to be essentially the same model that people had started discussion discussing. There wasn't that many radical changes to it that that were put forward in, in believable ways. And that 10 years put, went, went from around 1995 when the book was done to around um, 2005. But then after that 10-year period, as the, the framework emerged more or less intact, people started taking it and just running out and applying it. And when they started doing that, um, they, they stopped, um, in a sense, having conferences on that or getting together and discussing that. So it looked like it had just dispersed. And in a certain sense, it, it had. But what had happened previously is that if you were theoretically thinking about something like this, and we had um, journals that, that were being published at the time that were peer-reviewed based on integral meta theory. And there were over 60 different human disciplines that were reinterpreted completely using this integral framework to make more comprehensive and inclusive and holistic approaches. So, I mean, we had integral education, integral psychology, integral uh, sociology, integral art, integral history, integral medicine, integral business, integral law, literally over 60 disciplines like that. Um, and all of them claim to be happier with the result. They certainly included more aspects than they had previously. A lot of people are quite suspicious of spirituality. Yeah. Partly because they see that a lot of spiritual communities go bad. Um, and partly as a journalist, I feel I have to ask you this question as well. Um, there have been a, spiritual communities that have had a lot of bad press that have gone bad. The most high profile probably being Andrew Cohen. And he, he's been very, like, you've been very close to him in the past. What lessons can we learn from that? 
Yeah. <coughs> this is one item that <coughs> the integral framework has shed an enormous amount of light on. And <coughs> again, I'm not saying that there aren't other factors that are important, but here's one that's really, really central. Um, and, and it came up um, <coughs> earlier when we mentioned things like, um, yes, Buddhists can be doing this practice, but so can ISIS. And you go, okay, whoa. I mean, if all we're saying is, you know, do this kind of trying to find ultimate unity consciousness, that's not enough because it could produce ISIS or it could produce a nice Buddhist community. So what's the difference? One of the most striking things we found is that if you look at that actual waking up or enlightenment experience, which again, wherever it shows up, is claimed to be just simply by itself, the summum bonum, just by itself, it has everything that is perfect and, and you get that and you've got it all. You don't need anything else, that is complete liberation. Those experiences are indeed first person, direct, immediate experiences. So again, it's not a belief system, it's not even a mythic system in, in a typical sense of like Moses parting the Red Sea or Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt, or anything like that. These are direct immediate experiences that you have. So you can't see these stages of growing up by introspecting. And one of the things that that means is that every major spiritual tradition, including the meditative traditions that looked within and plumbed the depths of first person state experiences, not one of them saw structures of growing up at all. So there's not a single meditative system anywhere in the world that has an understanding of the stages of growing up. Literally, they're not there. So that's why you can be at almost any stage of growing up and go through the whole sequence of waking up. And, but you'll never know that. You'll just be interpreting that according to the stage of growing up that you're at. And that turns out to be disastrous because up until around the Western Enlightenment, when that orange world-centric grammar started to emerge, people were having waking up experiences and interpreting them from ethnocentric stages because that's essentially where they were. And so they could have this extraordinary experience of oneness, but it could be had only through their own particular approach. And so they ended up being indeed ethnocentric, even though they had this experience of oneness. So that's how somebody in ISIS, who's literally at a viciously fundamental ethnocentric stage of development, can still have this waking up experience, but they're going to interpret it in terms of, of, of that ethnocentric stage. This is the experience that I'm having with Allah, and only those who accept Allah can have that experience. And Sam will even say, you, you know, as these terrorist bombers are about to blow themselves up, many of them sort of have this smile of bliss and contentment because they're in this mystical state of waking up, and I'm sure some of them are, but they're having it at this ethnocentric, bigoted, prejudiced stage of development, and waking up won't cure that. That's the nightmare. Long and short is, is almost none of the Western developmental models have any of the waking up states. They don't have an understanding of enlightenment or awakening or the great liberation or moksha or satori or any of that. And so you have these stages of growing up and they have no understanding of the waking up stages. And then you have these systems of waking up and they have no comprehension of growing up stages. And these two things are relatively independent. You can be very high in one and very low on the other, very high in this and very low in this. But the point is there's not a single system in the world, including spiritual systems, that include both of those, ever. And that means humanity, throughout its 
entire history has been training itself to be broken. So part of the problem, even when you have a religious movement, a spiritual movement like Andrew Cohen, and they are very much aware of waking up states, and that's what they're after. They don't have an understanding of these growing up stages. And so they can be very much at ethnocentric with highly authoritarian guru dominant types of orientations and still be having stunning waking up experiences but then interpreting it all in terms of just this specific group is getting it and just their leader is the one that's giving this to you. And that's exactly what Andrew Cohen got into. Andrew understood integral theory quite well. And um, he and I actually would do a, a dialogue in, in their magazine, What is Enlightenment? And when he ended up crashing, well, first of all, he was always um, very uh, appreciative about the integral model. He talked about it a lot. But he himself still got caught in these growing up stage aspects. And he finally ended up interpreting what caused his crash is that he had this very mythic, ethnocentric, amber aspect of himself that really did take himself as being the one and ultimate guru who is the most enlightened person on the face of the planet. This is all falling down into ethnocentric and even lower, the stage right under that is egocentric. And you had some questions about, well, doesn't that happen? Yeah, that happens because it's just right there. And he got caught in that. And that's how he came to interpret the problem. And so he's, uh, it took several years off did a lot of work on that issue. And he's now coming back. Um, he has something uh, that I think he just calls integral triple gem, something along that line. And by the way, Buddha Dharma Sangha, that's another version of the four quadrants. It's another I, we, it um, trinity. So most of the problems with spiritual communities is that no matter how awakened they are truly having great degrees of waking up, they're not addressing and they have no way to address their stage of growing up. And as we've seen, that can be at virtually any of these stages. And it can be, if you're at a deeply ethnocentric stage and you have a profound waking up, all you've got is an enlightened Nazi, literally. That can happen. By the way, Himmler and those guys were really into yoga and these kinds of states, just like ISIS. One of the hugest problems that we have with religion in the world today is that all of them developed when waking up was understood and there was no comprehension of growing up. And so none of their teachings say, oh, and by the way, make sure that as you understand these great truths that you're also developing so that you get at least into world centric. Because if you're less than that, you're not helping. You are literally going to be open to a fascist, totalitarian, Nazi, you name it, bad news situation. And all having a waking up experience will do is make you more certain of your prejudice and your bigotry. And that is a disaster. <laughs>